Hello, everybody out there in social world. I hope everyone's having a great day and um, hope many of you have family members who are looking forward, hopefully, to having a great summer at camp uh, this year in spite of all the challenges in our lives. I wanted to uh, take a little bit of time today to share with all of you why camp experiences of all kinds are an optimal context for solving the skills gap for Generation Z. Uh, there really could not be a more exciting time to work in the field of camp today uh, with the work that we're doing around social emotional learning, 21st century learning skills. It is um, a really, really meaningful place to be. And um, it's tremendous to see the research coming back showing how, what an optimal context it is. So, but, so I want to tell you today a little bit more about camp uh, for those of you who don't know much about it and how why today it's so relevant uh, for Gen Z and helping to close the skills gap there and help them prepare for a, a new and very different economy that is approaching uh, them as they grow up and, and head out into the workforce. So first, some, some information about my organization, the American Camp Association. Um, the American Camp Association is um, is a is a is a 110 year old uh, national nonprofit charity uh, with uh, gosh we have well over 12,000 members and uh, 3,100 plus member camps serving over 10 million kids uh, kids teens adults uh, campers and they're served by over a million seasonal staff that are working you know in the summer months or in fall season spring season. Um, it's quite a big industry, uh, quite a big field, uh, $3.6 billion uh, in reach. Um, so you probably, some of you are wondering, you know, uh, what are all these staff doing, uh, serving all these kids? What is organized camp? But we call it organized camp because it's different from going camping as a family, right? It's a, it's a professionally run uh, camp experience where uh, the, the program is supervised uh, for children or youth or teens or emerging adults or even senior citizens, frankly, and families have camp too. Camp often happens in the summer and is called summer camp. And I know many people understand summer camp, but also camp happens throughout the year with schools and also uh, different youth programs uh, and senior programs, for example, as well. And those people that attend summer camps are called campers. But a modern... The modern camp, you know, can take place anywhere, really. Um, most people will think about Parent Trap and the classic American camp with canoes and archery and capture the flag, but it can also take place in the science museum or uh, in a coding class. Uh, there are lots of different kinds of camps and the American Camp Association, what we affectionately call as the ACA, uh, serves both day and overnight camps and family camps that are focused on uh, culture and special needs and also like uh, camps that work on school campuses or university campuses, faith-based camps, special need camps, uh, medical camps that are serving children or adults with specific medical needs, uh, activity specific specialty camps like academics or art or medical needs or sports. Um, we have nonprofit camps, we have for-profit camps, we have university camps, we have government run camps like Parks and Rec. We have secular camps of all kinds, overnight, day, young adult camps, senior camps, and so on. It's, it's quite a, a wide field. And um, it's, it's pretty exciting because today the American camping field is working very hard to um, serve all kids, to serve all uh, young adults uh, with, through camp experiences. Uh, diversity in camp programs is growing uh, rapidly. Uh, especially around day camps. Uh, there are millions of children going to day camp across our country. And um, so you, as you can see, uh, campers and staff of color are growing, a growing percentage within all campers, total campers in the United States. And also camps in America are um, really addressing uh, the, the STEM and STEAM needs of young people today by offering lots of programming around engineering and arts and mathematics, technology, it's, it's not just archery, uh, hiking, and uh, camping, and swimming these days, or horseback riding these days. So you might ask, what do you do outside? That's one of the things I love about camp. In many cases, but not all, camp is robustly programmed around the out of doors. 
we offer, uh, it's, for me, camp was a place where young people learn to really appreciate uh, nature. And uh, in this distracted age that we live in, uh, most camps, 95% of camps in America, report to us that they um, do not allow cellular technology or personal technology devices in their camps. They're trying to make it a human focused, human based, uh, human prioritized experience. So eyeballs to eyeball conversations happen all day, every day at camp. So out in nature, they're learning lots of different kinds of activities like canoeing and camping and hiking. They're learning about sustainable uh, uh, you know, environmental uh, awareness on how to create the sustainable environmental um, uh, programs. They're learning to kayak, they're learning to climb, they're learning to backpack, they're learning to stand up paddleboard, learning mountain biking. But I think even more importantly, they're really learning uh, how nature works uh, and how to name and understand uh, the creatures that live in nature, uh, plants and trees, uh, and how our uh, natural resources are so fragile and are such treasures. Really important to, to teach them that. So we have, it's really outdoor education, living out outside in camp. We also offer wilderness experiences, uh, all kinds of wilderness experiences. This could be a, a group of 11 year olds going out for their very first backpacking, like three night backpacking trip. Or it could be a wilderness trip in a wilderness uh, area uh, that is much more extensive. 21% uh, of our wilderness experiences are, are significant in that they are for more than three nights. Um, we also um, offer a lot of uh, domestic, international, and trip and travel style uh, programs that are wilderness focused all over the world. Um, so uh, there's a lot of focus in the camp space around nature and the outdoors. But we also offer indoor, indoor programs as well um, of all kinds. So I know you're wondering, why is camp different now, Tom? Why is it more different? Why is it a catalyst for growth today more than ever? And this is really what I wanted to share with you today. Um, with, with Generation Z, um, we have an opportunity to really help them develop their uh, essential human skills, right? So out of school time, right now, schools all across the country are working hard to, to, to implement um, CASEL uh, social emotional learning standards uh, off, you know, per, uh, that are suggested by CASEL, collaborative uh, collaborative academic, social, and emotional learning. Um, but out of school time, like camp, uh, immersive camp, uh, has really been working in this space for quite a long time, helping young people develop social and emotional learning competencies, learning how to be a part of a community, learning how to contribute uh, and thrive in school and outside of school. And then that they're, what we're seeing in the research is that they research suggests that they are carrying uh, these competencies with them through to college, to work, and later into life. Um, at camp, kids are learning to try new things. They're learning to take positive risks, and they're learning to fail, and fail forward, and try again, and become more resilient, right? They're developing social skills. They're becoming more socially aware. They're becoming, they're learning how to be a friend. They're learning how to explore. What we try to think about in the camp world is how do we help young people today and the adults that serve them develop a growth mindset, right? We want to help them become lifelong learners. We want them to be lifelong explorers, ever so curious, ever so interested in learning more and more. Again, learning to make mistakes, learning to be resilient and try again. Um, this day and age, as a parent, I find that with my own child, I tend to bubble wrap him. I tend to hold him back from taking positive risks uh, for fear that he might hurt himself. But camp is a safe, and I would say emotionally and physically safe place where young people are able to try new things, take positive risks and make mistakes and learn to work through those mistakes in a loving setting of friends and fellowship in a, in a, in a program that's been designed especially uh, to help them fail forward uh, and learn from those experiences. We teach teamwork. We teach positive identity. We help young people learn how to reflect and think about who they want to be and how they want to make a difference in the world in the days to come. We teach them about personal health management. They're having an independent experience, really, from their parents. 
And so, um, and this is a hard thing for parents and this can be a hard thing the first time for young people when they go, go away to camp for the first time, whether it's day camp or overnight camp. But camp is really about, um, you know, uh, taking those positive risks, um, learning how to belong to a group and look eyeball to eyeball and have deep conversations an incredibly reflective and wonderful time to think about how they think and who they want to be. So we think about that as a critical part of positive youth development today. It's a critical part of social and emotional learning competencies and education. And all of our different kinds of camps, whether they're a faith-based camp or a cultural camp or an activity-based camp or a day camp or national brand camps like the Y, the J, uh, these are really important. We also have uh, something about camp called Camps on Campus I'll share a little bit with you about as well. And we are really involved as ACA, we're involved in something called accredited camps, which I'll mention later in the presentation as well. So camp is a really exciting time to help Gen Z um, be who they are and help them become who they wanna be and do it outside very often, although not always, and in a really engaging way. So what we're really all about is helping not just campers, right, but also staff and family through different modalities of camp, develop a sense of belonging in an undistracted environment with immersive experiences. So think about what that means. How, how many times today do young people have the opportunity to put their phone down for days, for days on end where they are immersively engaged in a intentional community that is child-centered, where they're uh, feeling a great deal of attention and they're learning to give more than they receive. They're learning to lead. They're learning to follow. They're learning to listen more than they speak. And they're learning uh, to try new things. They also uh, are surrounded by young adults who are role models, who are also learning uh, through camp. And they, through, in, in this way, both the staff members who serve them and the campers have lots of opportunity for choice and voice. And as I mentioned before, camp is really intentionally built and designed and trained for to be a safe and supporting environment where kids do feel emotionally safe. And this is saying a lot today. Today, kids find many of their environments to be challenging physically or emotionally. And so we work really hard in the, in the field of camp to conquer that and to help young people feel engaged in an emotionally safe and physically safe way. And that leads to a thriving adult experience, right? That means we help them be a great citizen in a community, giving more than they're receiving, learning to lead, learning to follow. Uh, we teach them to be great environmental stewards. We help them uh, learn how to learn and prioritize their lifelong education they're going to have many different careers in their life, many different tasks, many different jobs, and they will need to learn to suck the marrow of learning from each and every one of those experiences, carry it with them to the next experience. Uh, we are uh, helping them contribute to the workforce. We're helping them build community and we're helping them develop and, you know, sense their identity for their, for their life ahead. Pretty exciting stuff. So why is this important? Uh, well, let me tell you, uh, today, I think we all know 95%, the data shows that 95% of all young people have access to smartphones, regardless of gender, race, ethnicity, or socioeconomics, right? This is a very digital, uh, a very digital generation. We know this, one of my favorite studies from the Pew Research Center is one that they did on teens, technology, and friendship back in 2015. In that study, they found that just one out of four teens was spending, uh, was, was, was spending uh, time with friends in person outside of school on a daily basis. So let me say that again. Just one out of four teens was spending time uh, with friends in person outside of school on a daily basis. Wow. So it begs the question, where is this generation learning to practice their in-person social skills? We also know that nearly half of teens say that text messaging is their first choice for communicating with their closest friends. They're really creating friends online more than they're creating friends offline. And the data from this Pew Research Center study is showing 
that online friends, only, only one out of five online friends in that study uh, were making its way to the in-person realm. So again, where are they developing and learning to test and enrich their in-person social skills? We know that, that Gen Zers are competent at forming friendships online, right? But how do we help them do this in person? They, these these in-person skills we're, we're seeing article after article in the press today from the corporate world are saying, we need to have uh, college graduates and other workers who have highly developed social and emotional learning skills. Additionally, uh, we're seeing, so we're seeing all this screen time, right? So I have a 12 year old, he is on his screen as much as we will let him. And we measure that and we work hard at being intentional about it. But the more screen time this generation is having, the less time they're having just having in-person social interaction in a relaxed free time kind of way. Uh, I think we all can uh, agree that it we're seeing in the media and in research uh, studies that are coming out from the CDC and other sources, increased loneliness, increased depression, and worse. But this, this is a generation that is at the forefront of a mental health crisis, that the likes of which we have not seen in decades. Rates of teen depression and suicide have been skyrocketing since 2011. 70% of teens report anxiety and depression is a major problem among their peers, cutting across gender and socioeconomic lines. This is a Pew Research Center study from 2019. 59% in, uh, there's been a 59% increase in the total number of teens who recently experienced depression over the past decade. Uh, this is pretty significant. And uh, so, you know, one might say that, and I think it's been well written and documented that Gen Z teens feel more physically safe and are more physically safer than ever before, but yet are more mo mentally and emotionally vulnerable. Gen Z uh, teens are also much more risk averse. Um, this past summer, the CDC, um, uh, your, this past summer, the CDC's Youth Risk Behavior Survey noted significant increases in the number of high schoolers who experienced persistent feelings of sadness and hopelessness. The, the, and also seriously considered attempting suicide or making a suicide plan. I think you probably know this from the media, but just to point it out, uh, in, when Theresa May was prime minister of England in 2018, she named two brand new cabinet ministers in 2018. In January, uh, she, uh, 2018, she named a minister of loneliness. Yes, a minister of loneliness and a minister of suicide prevention. I thought she was um, right on, on the spot there with those moves. And I think um, the, this is a global problem, not uh, just here in the United States. So um, this, this is a generation that, you know, when we talk about them being more emotionally or mentally vulnerable, we know uh, from studies that um, they're, they're growing slower than, uh, than uh, the generation before them or the generation before that generation. 18-year-olds are emotionally behaving like 15-year-olds. 15-year-olds are emotionally behaving like 12-year-olds used to. So um, another example, uh, you probably know, everyone that's listening probably knows that uh, this is a generation that's less likely to go out without their parents than previous generations. This is a generation that's less likely to date at the same ages where you may have dated in your generation. They're less likely to work after school. And as parents, we're, we're very often very supportive of that. But because they're not take, having those after school work opportunities, um, there are lost uh, positive risk opportunities to learn in an independent setting away from mom and dad. We tend to bubble wrap them, right? And we cocoon them. And in fact, I think we could all agree that in many ways in our own world as adults today, we are showing them and demonstrating that uh, cocooning is what we are doing. So um, how do we encourage kids to, um, to, to take more positive risk, to uh, try new things? When, when kids do that, like, let's just pause for a second and think about how did you learn? How did you learn to take positive risks? Well, uh, I think a lot of what happens when you're growing up, uh, at least in the past, what we we saw our we learned who we were uh, through reflections of the people we were around, and we uh, took positive risks, and we learned uh, to mitigate those risks, and we learned to be successful, trying and trying and trying again after several failures. 
um, we are robbing this generation from the opportunity to take those positive risks. So camp experiences can be exceptionally therapeutic and can be that place for young people who have had adverse childhood experiences or trauma to um, live in a super intentional child-centered universe where they are focused on 100% of the time in a human way and they can learn um, to feel more confident in themselves, have more self-esteem, uh, be nurtured to a place where they're willing to take more positive risk and also enjoy the outdoors. Um, so um, today at camp, one of the things that's changed with this particular generation is we're, we're having to hire and add to our camp teams, our professional teams at camp, more professional support for trauma-informed care of this generation. Not just the campers, but also the college-age staff who are also Gen Zers, who also um, are looking to develop more, more fully emotionally and mentally. Uh, camps are places also of physical exercise. Kids are having lots of vigorous exercise every day at camp, doing fun activities outside and inside. They are also having uh, solid, three solid meals and snacks each day which are uh, appropriately developed through dietitians, And so they're learning healthy eating practices and they're getting lots of uh, physical exercise. It's really wonderful. Um, so, um, so I just really wanna talk about um, a context, camp as a context in the 21st century. Why, why does this matter so much? Well, we've talked about Gen Z and some of the challenges that they're facing uh, in, today. Uh, and, and how we might be able to help them. I also wanted to just mention to you uh, the work world, right? This is not news. You, you're reading the paper and you're seeing the World Economic Forum in particular, and also major corporations across the country articulate for the last five years that in 2020, the top skills would be these things like complex problem solving, critical thinking and creativity, learning to negotiate, learning to think, flexibly, changing the way you think depending on the situation, learning to coordinate with others, emotional intelligence. We've been hearing this for a while, but there's still a skills gap. And so uh, part of what we're seeing in the camp space is there's a train wreck approaching. Uh, this, uh, you know, an oncoming train, right smack for Gen Z. They are, we, you know, they are uh, a wonderful generation, but um, they need to develop these human skills uh, in order to be, uh, to, in order to qualify, frankly, for the most highly compensated positions in the future um, and to be relevant in the workforce. And um, so um, the, 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 the coming economy, according to uh, Knowledge Works Foundation, World Economic Forum, they call it different things, but it's basically a human skill uh, economy uh, where the, everything is automated that can be automated and AI artificial intelligence is employed in everyday decision-making at work. So our young people who are growing up right now, they need to develop highly, they need to develop high, high, highly uh, developed human skills. Can't get that out, can I? Um, so talent, not technology, is gonna be a really important uh, success factor for this generation. Here are those top 10 uh, skills. And I know you've seen this before, um, and so we're excited that Gen Z, you know, here they are heading into this fourth industrial revolution with like 12 technologies that are evolving around them faster than they can imagine that are connected in ways that we have a hard time understanding. They, they, they are actually starting to understand this blockchain and uh, internet of things. They are understanding it pretty well, but we need to help them lean in on their human skills. So uh, you know, here's a slide. This slide really articulates right straight from Knowledge Works Foundation the kinds of core competencies that Gen Z must develop successfully in order to be really relevant in the work world of, of tomorrow. And we're talking about 2030, really. And I, I believe it's happening faster. Uh, I believe it's arriving now. So this is a generation where they have to develop a deep self knowledge of who they are, what they know, and what an understanding humbly, frankly, of what they don't know and a desire to figure it out. They need to have a strong inner self. This is a generation that's going to have tons of data coming at them 
in terms of feedback and um, uh, uh, think about all the data we're collecting today and imagine where that will be in 2030. This generation has to be resilient. They have to receive feedback and get up and keep trying and try again and try again. They have to be reflective and they have to be able to form positive connections with other people. I think of them as, I think of them like I want my son to grow up and part of, be part of a generation of inventors, of design thinkers, of innovators, right? And creatives. Those are the competencies that will matter most in terms of human skills tomorrow. They have to be able to develop and manage complicated relationships. And they really have to have a lot of uh, intuition and social emotional awareness of others. They have to be able to sense and interpret and can communicate information about the world and other people. So I don't, I mean, for me, I love people watching in the airports back when we were allowed to go to the airport. And I, um, I know that um, this is a skill that Gen Z would like to, uh, would like to develop uh, and they need more help developing it. They also need to be um, great executive, they need to develop a great executive functioning. They need good decision, you know, how to make good decisions, how to focus and be attentive to their work, developing memory skills, developing relationships, and of course, learning how to maintain, develop and maintain good physical and mental health, good work, good work habits around that. They, uh, they really need to be able to understand and recognize their own emotions, understand triggers as they are about to happen, and then take a deep breath and shift to a balanced, productive emotional state, right? That's what they need to be able to, be, to do. Emotional regulation is one of the biggest challenges that we're seeing in Gen Z today and being able to understand where they're at and move from. So learning to become more mindful is a big part of what they learn at camp, right? Learning to be spontaneous and, um, and be in the moment. That's another piece of camp. We want them to really be socially aware and empathetic, learning to build relationships of all kinds to support learning. Saying that again, learning to build social relationships of all kinds to support learning, support collaboration and innovation, right? Humbly, we want to teach them to admit to mistakes and ask for help, really important. And of course, this is gonna be a very fast paced dynamic world that they'll be working in where uh, they'll be really involved in what we're calling taskification. Well, they'll be working on projects more than careers. And there'll be so many different projects in their, their long lives. They need to be adaptable. They need to learn to be more resourceful and they need to be able to balance their confidence with humility uh, in an even way. That was great. Oh, great. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Oh, we're running late. We're running short. Um, so we have, um, you know, at camp, we really think about growth mindset and the hierarchy of needs. You can read them here. We want them to be to practice inclusion, to practice relationship skills, take initiative, take those positive risks, embrace mistakes and learning opportunities and, and learn resilience and learn to be creative problem solvers. So camp really is a catalyst for growth. It is um, a, an amazing, unique uh, setting in which we can help develop the next generation of uh, leaders and uh, corporate leaders and community leaders and faith leaders for our country. Uh, these are capacities and strategies that they can apply to the rest of their life. And we're seeing that they're carrying these 21st century skills and companies for competencies forward. Uh, already we're seeing that happening in a, in a robust way. These are transferable skills. So I just wanted to remind you one more time of how we do that in camp and how that leads to how camp is a catalyst for growth and how that leads to a thriving adult life as a, a great citizen with a fully formed and inspired identity. Um, we, we, uh, we can't do enough today to help these young folks develop positive growth mindset, teach them to collaborate, critically think, communicate, discuss, debate, right? all of that. We want them to be curious. We want them to be responsible, have self-control, emotional regulation, and playfulness, right? Don't we need more playfulness at work and in life? Absolutely. So uh, I, one last little plug, if I may, Nikki, um, there are lots of different camps out in the world today. Not every camp is accredited. 
Uh, to give you an idea, there are roughly 14,000 camps in America, we estimate, and approximately, you know, not more than 3,000 of them are accredited by the American Camp Association. Accreditation is a, uh, it means that your camp has voluntarily be, uh, invested itself in understanding and implementing policies that reflect industry recognized standards for health, safety, and risk management of camp operations. This includes everything from how we uh, manage our kitchens to how we screen and hire and background check staff and train them. Um, as a parent, uh, you know, you really wanna make sure that your children are attending accredited camps. Camps are, are governed uh, at the state level. They're regulated at the state level. Not every state is regulating camp very much at all. And so the only way uh, you as a parent can choose uh, a camp that where you can be assured that the camp meets industry recognized foundational standards in health, safety, and risk management in all 50 states is if you see this, this sign, if they are accredited by the American Camp Association. We've been doing that for over 70 years. Uh, and um, it's, it's, these are foundational basic standards uh, in the field.